Hello everyone. My voice is not 100%, but we're going to see what we can do as we dig deeper into the cask of Amontillado, though perhaps that's a poor choice of words given the context of the story. We are, though, going to be going over a lot of the material that you've already looked at, so if you want to pull out your plot diagram and your worksheet on this, those you can adjust as we go along to add some more detail and so that you know what things in particular I'll be looking at when we test on this material. So let's take a look first at that plot diagram. First off, we got to start the exposition. The exposition shows us two people, Montresor, the narrator, who is not named at first, but we find that out as we go along, and Fortunato, his supposed friend. The place that we're in is, of course, the catacombs during Carnival. And the problem that we're told right away is that Fortunato has insulted his friend Montresor, and now Montresor is determined to get revenge. Now, that means that really we have two conflicts here. The clear external conflict, which is Montresor versus Fortunato, and that internal conflict, which is Mont Montresor versus his own revenge. And we'll see as the story goes along who really wins those conflicts. The inciting force here is when Montresor and Fortunato meet up and Montresor convinces Fortunato to come with him to find the wine in the catacombs. Now this has to be the inciting force because without this moment, the story would have not happened. Um, while Fortunato might still have been killed by Montresor in a different way, this is the thing that convinces Fortunato to go into the catacombs, something that he probably otherwise would not have done, even though it was normal to store those wines in the catacombs themselves. I mean, get storage wherever you can, right? Well, that leads us to the rising action. Now, in the rising action, we know that they go into the catacombs, and you could have had so many things here. Fortunato keeps coughing more and more. Montresor tries to get him to go back, pretending that he actually cares. We have this weird moment where Montresor, Montresor reveals that he's carrying the shovel after making a joke about the Freemasons, which, okay, if you are in the catacombs with someone and they just randomly pull a shovel out of their cloak, you should maybe run the other way because that is, that's some serious red flags right there. But um, even more so, they get to that niche because Fortunato, of course, is drunk and is not thinking straight. He still continues to follow his friend. And um, Montresor convinces Fortunato to go get the Amontillado from it. And then that's when Fortunato's chained up, chained up and Montresor begins to break up the wall. Now, this is still in the rising action, despite what some of you guys said. In fact, even Fortunato's screaming goes into the rising action. And that's because the climax of the story is actually when Montresor hesitates after Fortunato's scream, and then screams back. Now, you should be familiar with why this is the, the climax of the story. The reason why this is the climax is because this is the moment where the character is making his final choice, whether or not he will let his friend live. And you can see that this is this point of no return, because up until then, he can really let his friend go. We see afterwards that Fortunato is more than willing to pretend that this whole thing is a joke, and he's drunk enough that Montresor could probably pull it off and convince him that, oh, this was just a prank, nothing happened. So at this point, Fortunato still could survive. And we hear this hesitation in that first moment where Fortunato is screaming in terror. It says, For a brief moment I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rap rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand on the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. Now, this is the point where we see Montresor has made his choice. He hesitates, he almost is overcome, and yet he decides this is what he wants. He reaches for the catacombs, and he feels satisfaction, and he has chosen to follow through the revenge. After this, there really is no turning back from him. He has lost that internal conflict against his desire for revenge, and he is really fulfilling that revenge um, externally. So both conflicts have reached their head, and Montresor has made his choice. That leaves us with the falling action. In the falling action, we see that Fortunato thinks it's a joke. Montresor yells at him that this is the end, and he said, for the love of God. Now this is showing that he really believes 
according to his own words, that Fortunato deserves what he's getting. Like, this is a just thing. This is done according to God, which we know is absolutely false, and we'll talk about more later. We also see that Fortunato goes silent in the falling action. This is where he is dying, likely of a heart attack um, rather than anything else, because he's incredibly stressed, as he would be. He's sick, he can't breathe right, and that mold is really getting to him. So that is where he dies. Montresor's heart grew sick in response, but he does pack it up with the last brick in and puts the old design over it so no one can find it. And that leads us to a resolution, which is really the final lines of the story, where we are told that Montresor gets away with it. Not the best happy ending. So let's talk about some of the finer details in the story itself, starting with symbolism. The symbolism here is present in three major places. The setting, which we've already talked about at the introduction of the story, and the catacombs and the carnival both represent ideas. Catacombs, of course, are symbols of death, and the carnival itself is that symbol of sin and um, impunity and also celebration. We also have what the characters wore. Um, this is something that you guys might need to adjust in your worksheets. Montresor, dressed in all black, is actually wearing a classic assassin's costume, which you guys can see in the picture. It's a pretty creepy costume, but it is pretty typical for Carnival, and they have some pretty neat, elaborate um, uniforms. So it wouldn't exactly be shocking to see him in the assassin's costume, though that's some major foreshadowing. Fortunato himself is wearing a fool's costume. Um, that is jester's gear. In other words, he's literally dressed like a fool or an idiot. Their clothing represents kind of their internal traits. Fortunato is portrayed as an idiot, and Montresor is, of course, an assassin in the story. So they're wearing what they actually are representing inside. Or, <laughs> sorry, they're wearing what they actually have inside. Last is the Cask of Amontillado. You guys did a great job in your worksheets with this. The Cask of Amontillado symbolizes revenge, and you have to be ready to support this. First off, we know that it symbolizes revenge because both of them go into the catacombs seeking the Cask of Amontillado, and what Fortunato wants is the literal cask, the wine, and what Montresor wants is revenge. So since those are the things that they want, the things that they are seeking, it means that that cask does represent revenge. You can also talk about how he tells him that the Amontillado is in the niche when he's breaking him in, showing him like this is the revenge, this is that, that thing that we've been searching for. And the repeated use of revenge right after talking about the cask of Amontillado is another instance of support. So let's talk about the huge amount of foreshadowing, because this whole thing is just red flags for Fortunato. He's just too drunk to see it. First off, the Montresors have this family motto that tells you that they will get revenge no matter what. That's some pretty serious foreshadowing. Also, we have this really clever move by Montresor told to us right at the beginning, where he told his servants to stay home and work on this holiday, even though he was not going to be back there, and that he would punish them severely if they didn't work. Now this is really sneaky and clever because it provides for him an opportunity to have an alibi because his servants are definitely not going to work if no one's there to enforce them, but they won't dare say that they left for fear of the punishment that they'll have for leaving their post. So Montresor can go there knowing that his place will be empty and also knowing that people will pretend that they had been there the whole time and say that he never came. So he has um, some pretty clever moves here. Some other foreshadowing is the coffin mold, which um, symbolize Fortunato's coming death and the evil that kind of grows from Montresor. We have this Freemason joke, which is very odd. Now the Freemasons, in order to understand this joke, um, which I might ask about, the Freemasons are a secret society that believe in human knowledge being the solution to problems. It is definitely cult-like vibes, and with the Freemason Society, they often use secret hand gestures to show that they were members, and high-ranking society would often be members of this um, club, for lack of a better word. Um, and in this 
Freemason society, we see that they will greet each other and make that gesture. So when Fortunato makes the gesture towards Montresor, he's asking him if he is a Freemason. And Montresor's response, yes, yes, is interesting because he is saying that he is a Freemason, but doesn't understand that hand symbol. And in response, to explain why he is a Mason but doesn't know that, he pulls out a shovel. Now, what he's doing is a play on words. Instead of being the Freemason Society, he's saying he's a Mason worker, which is a brick worker. And we know that that is bad news for Fortunato, because he's planning on bricking him into the wall. So this Mason joke is actually huge amounts of foreshadowing and a little bit of a play on words. Um, also, massive red flag, if you are in the catacombs and somebody has a shovel, please, please get out of there. They are not up to any sort of good. So we also have a lot of other things. We are told directly that Montresor is going to kill Fortunato. We have this niche, which is described at the same dimensions as a coffin. And I mean, they're in the catacombs, all right? They're surrounded by death. That is itself a massive bit of foreshadowing. And we could just go on and on. I saw some other examples in you guys' paper. Like I said, this whole thing is red flags for Fortunato. So the next thing is, does Montresor show any regret or sign that he knew this was wrong? And this is where we did have some issues in the worksheet. Montresor does show regret, but you'll only notice it if you realize that he is an unreliable narrator. Now, as you can see, an unreliable narrator is somebody who's either deliberately deceptive or unintentionally misguided. And having an unreliable narrator forces the reader to question their credibility as a storyteller. In other words, you can't believe everything that they're going to tell you. Now, Montresor is fully unhinged, all right? He is unreliable, for sure. And what he tells us is that Fortunato deserves this revenge, and he shows a lot of pride that he got away with it. But remember that he's unreliable check his actions and reactions as well and see if they match up fully with his words. First off, we note that he does hesitate to actually kill Fortunato. And when Fortunato is silent, he seems legitimately worried. And after he knows for sure that it's too late, they have this small moment where he feels sick. He blames it immediately on the catacombs, but even this little moment is enough to show that Montresor knows his actions are wrong, and he is affected by them, regardless of what he tells the reader. So there is some regret, even if it's covered up almost immediately. So that leaves us with the end. What is the theme of the story? Well, there are two major themes that we're going to talk about. The first is that revenge can drive people to extremely evil acts. And this is shown by the cask itself, that is the thing that drives them into the catacombs. And we know that that symbolizes revenge. And we see that theme of revenge and the word revenge repeated over and over. So that's how we know that this is one of the major themes. Not to mention the story centers around this. The whole point of the story is the narrator doing a horrendously evil murder to somebody who is supposedly his friend. And all of this is out of revenge for an action that we're not even told what it is. The second theme is that deception, hatred, and evil can be hidden under facades, which are like a front um, or a false face of friendliness, revelry, and care. So revelry is like celebration. Now this theme is present again all the way throughout the story. We can see that the catacombs and carnival themselves are this idea of um, decay and evil underneath something that looks like good. So in the Carnival, we've got um, a party that really hides a lot of sin. And in the catacombs, you've got this underground death and decay to the city itself. The costumes also show this. They are literally hiding themselves from each other and putting on fronts. And last but not least, the actions of Montresor versus his appearance throughout the whole story really talk about deception, hatred, and evil, despite his friendliness and joy and carelessness and even care for his friend on the surface. So we are presented with these two major themes. Be ready to explain how you know that theme is present or where it's present in the story. And that will be it for the Cask of Amontillado. I hope you guys enjoyed this rather creepy story.